seen are temporal. So if I was looking at that, fear would have just engulfed me this morning. You see, so things that are seen, they're temporal. Keep our eyes steadfast on his word. Listen to his word. Even so, I know sometimes our situation may be dire and we have we can't have faith. We, we just can't see where we're going and we're so frustrated. But it says, faith as small as a mustard seed. Yes. Just as small as a mustard seed. Yeah. Yes, it will move our mountains. So despite our situation, despite what our circumstances look like, those things are temporal. Keep your eyes steadfast on the Lord. Keep trusting in his words because his words cannot return unto him for Amen. Yes, but it must accomplish what he was set out to accomplish. Amen. Amen. so true that devil just wants a witch right in there doesn't he but we don't want to let him and what pastor ray was talking about last sunday i remember your sermon last sunday pastor ray how we are to pray speaking out not just in our mind not whispering but speak it out let god hear and also let the devil hear that
and we exalt you. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. You may be seated for a moment. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, God. Wow, God can speak. Sorry. What happens with Mike? Oh, it's not there. Okay. Surprise, surprise. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, uh, that was funny. Oh, uh, God can shape the world. That He created the universe he created can you imagine when we ask what he can do for us Amen. when we cry out to God and say God why mm. he hears and he can help yes. he is there for you wow I really enjoyed this worship time thank you <clears throat> um I also welcome our first timers. Um, I hope you feel at home here already. And uh, just welcome everyone else and also those watching online. You get to see us in action. What happens? Oh. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, oh, our announcements. Okay. Our announcements today are on Wednesday evenings. Uh, we'll soon be able to come to the church, I think, for our prayer time. But until the pastor says so, we're going to be at home praying with our families or wherever it might be. It might be even at work. Uh, take time to pray. Pray for one another. Yes. Pray for our, our happenings and our health system, and our pastor, and you know, our, like our family, our, our, our personal, personal family, our true family, and um, yeah, even the city of Camrose. How about that? Pray for our home, home city, our hometown. Okay, I asked if Brother Tim would come. And we're, now we're going to take the offering. And uh, so uh, after he prays, just come up. The offering plate is here. Uh, what we do for our COVID entries, we come up in the center, give ourselves a little space, and then go around the outside to the back to our, our um, places. Brother Tim. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to be with us right now, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity we have to be in your presence. Yes. Lord, as a group, Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, you just open up our hearts. Lord, to your word today, Lord, be with us now as we worship you with our ties and offerings, Lord. Lord, I pray that we'd all just give a joyful heart as we love to give and help others, Lord. I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would your kingdom, Lord. Use us as well this week, I pray, dear Heavenly Father. Just I pray to your Holy Spirit, we're just working with each and every one of us. Like I said, Lord, just bless these ties and honor. Amen. Okay, just come up and we'll receive your offering.
pastor has to say, and it will be good. I know well, always lives. So just prepare your hearts here. Here he comes. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you so much, Sister Shirley. So good to see you all in the house of the Lord today. We gather together to worship, and for those of you that are at home joining us online, we never want to forget you. We still consider you, you are still a part of this family, and we look forward to when you are able to come back and, <coughs> pardon me, just come and join with us as we worship our God and Savior together. Hallelujah, blessed be the name of the Lord. We serve a great and awesome God. And we just give him all the praise and the glory and honor today. Thank you to our visitors who uh, chose to come and worship with us today. In this time, you don't often get visitors. 
so many people are just staying home and hunkering down for coronavirus. So it's not likely that we will get visitors, but uh, we want to thank those that uh, are visitor among us today for coming to worship with us. And we pray that you'll be blessed and encouraged. And uh, at the end of the service, you would have said it was good for us to be in the house of the Lord. I know we don't have a lot of announcements because we have cut back on a few things that we normally do in an effort to limit our gathering, but we still make an effort to come on Sabbath, Sunday morning to come and worship, but we're not doing Bible study and those things for right now, but I pray that you take the time to study and to read God's word and to build up uh, your most holy faith. The Bible says, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Workmen not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. I just want to bless the Lord and give him glory. Sister Rosalind, it's good to see you. Amen. Hallelujah. My wife says she met you in the store and she kind of said you're back. I don't know what back entails, but I hope you're back in cameras or whatever. But whether you're visiting or not, it's good to see you again. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you feeling good to be in the house of the Lord today? Are you ready for the word? Yes. Hallelujah. I, I, I anticipate, I look forward to coming to minister in the word of God to the saints. And, uh, sorry, can you up? I consider it a privilege. I consider it a honor to be able to come and to minister the word of the Lord to you. What God has placed in my heart. And sometimes I don't know why God gives me certain messages to preach, but I just want to be obedient to him. He knows why. He knows what you are going through. And I thank him for the way he speaks to my heart. Um, before I get into the word, this morning we we're getting ready to come to church and uh, my son got dressed and I looked at his jeans pants and there's a little hole at the jeans pants. I said, son, why are you wearing that jeans pants to church with a hole in it? I'm like, go on, look, can't you find a different jeans pants? And then <laughs> Janae said, dad, it's a holy jeans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess he's coming to church and it's okay to wear a holy pants to church, so. I don't know if he wore it or if he took it off. I, I just I just laughed and left it. So okay, he's wearing a holy pants to church today. So <laughs> bless the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm gonna ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter one. We're gonna read it slowly, methodically, and carefully. You may want to underline some things or highlight some things. But we're going right back to the very beginning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good. Now, as we read through this, every time you see it was good, I want you to declare it with me. Is that all right? So let's go back to verse 3. Then God, some of you might be reading different versions and so on, but I believe, you know, even if your version doesn't say specifically it was good, just say it was good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Verse three, then God 
said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good. Amen. Hallelujah. You're with me today. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and he, the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. Hallelujah. And it was so. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Amen. We're getting somewhere. So the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens by the day from the night for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give a light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the less, lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Stay with me. Don't fall asleep on me. We're just starting out. Verse 19. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, every living thing that moves, God created them. Wow with which the waters abound according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. We're getting the theme of what this is all about. It was good. Verse 22. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, 
and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. A few more verses, verse 29. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. There's nothing about meat there. Uh, I mean, not yet anyways. Verse 30. Also to every beast of the earth to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. So animals never used to devour animals. The lions in Africa didn't wait for the, the zebras and all those different animals. Verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, somebody say indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but before it was, and it was good, and it was good. Now we get to the end, and it says, and indeed, it was very good. Amen, somebody. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them, chapter 2, were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we come before you. I come before you to minister to your people. I thank you for this word that you have placed in my heart. Now as I stand, Lord, let me say nothing more, nothing less, except what you would have me to speak. Father, I submit myself to you. Take full control. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Prepare the hearts of your people to receive your word today, God. Saturate this place with your presence, mighty God. We bless you. We glorify you. We give you all glory. For your name is exalted in this place. You are the reason why we have gathered here. We come to bless you and to be blessed by you. We thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you are about to do. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ and the saints of God says, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to assume by now you've kind of got the drift of what the title of my sermon, my message will be today. And it was good. And it was good. A friend and I, we often have uh, different conversations at work. And uh, we talk about religion. We talk about politics and so many different things. And uh, he's, he claims to be an atheist. He says he doesn't believe in God. And so he's trying to poke a lot of holes at my theology of my faith and why I believe in what I believe. And in our conversations, there were times when he would say, why? Why would God place the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden? And I would try to explain to him that if you look at the scriptures carefully, the Bible said in the midst of the garden was the tree of life. The Bible also goes on to say, but in the midst of the garden was the 
tree of knowledge of good and evil. So if both trees are in the midst of the garden, what do you have? Two trees side by side. I said, God is love. And love has to do with a choice. God didn't make robots. He made us with choice, with free will. And so if there is no option to choose contrary to what God has declared, then choice really is not choice. In other words, choice cannot be exercised because you only have one. And so in the midst of the garden was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God says, you shall not touch it, you shall not eat from it, for on the day you do, you will surely die. Long story short, he is using an example like that to blame God for the condition of mankind that men fell. We had the fall took place in the garden and it transcended down to every generation and sin was introduced and evil was introduced and all those things was introduced to the human race. But I challenged him and I said, why are you blaming God for our problem? Why are you blaming God? And the, the truth of the matter is, many folks, when things are going bad, they're not quick to blame Satan. Even the unbeliever who claims not to believe in God, when things go bad, they'll blame God. Why blame God? God gave Adam and Eve so much freedom. Think about this for a moment. They could do any and everything, and it would not be sinful, except for just one thing. How many things can you and I do today that will be considered sinful? A lot, right? So they were so free. Do whatever you want to do, Adam and Eve. Just don't do this one thing. And the one thing that God said not to do was the very thing the serpent was able to deceive them. They took from it the tree and they ate. It is almost equivalent. I remember hearing, uh, I remember if it was on the TV or on the radio, but people were talking and they were, they were talking about um, ladies and about assault, sexual assault and on and on. And one guy was saying something to the effect, well, these young girls, they need to stop wearing those short skirts. And I thought to myself, and somebody else came on the radio and said, hold on a second, hold on a second. No, 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 no. The problem is not with the girl wearing a short skirt. The problem is with the guy. The problem is not with the lady wearing a short skirt. Don't put the blame on her. The problem is with the man. With his heart, with his lust, or whatever. So I'm saying to my friend, don't blame God for putting the tree there. Come on, let's take some ownership here and stop blaming God for everything. So we read in the story, and every act of creation, the scripture would go on and the Bible would say, and it was good. It was good. God said to Adam and Eve, as he said to the other creatures, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Children would ask their parents at times, where does babies come from? <laughs> How are babies made? <laughs> and in church, those subject matters aren't brought up. Sex, the... the <laughs> You know why? My because what God has made holy, Satan has corrupted. Satan has hijacked 
what God has made holy. When God, be fruitful and multiply. You don't just walk in, look at your life, and you're like, uh -huh, and then uh, she's pregnant. <laughs> that, that's not how it works. <laughs> There's a little more chemistry than that. But God said it. Am I right? But we don't really talk about those things in church. I don't know if there's a degree of a shame or, or whatever. No, no, don't touch that stuff. Don't talk. God said in the Bible, Adam and Eve, if I'm remembering correctly, it's either take care of the garden or this one, be fruitful and multiply the first commandment. Let me break this down for you. After the flood, God put a sign in the sky. We call it the rainbow. rainbow. And why did God put the rain? God says, this, when there is a storm, you will see the rainbow in the sky, and it will be a memorial between me and you that never again will I destroy the earth with a flood. The rainbow, the rainbow, the rainbow. The theological connection to the rainbow, but none of us would want to wear anything that has the rainbow colors into church. Why? Because the LGBT community has hijacked the whole rainbow colors and what you know what one time I was gonna I was gonna make myself a t-shirt big rainbow colors and stuff and wrote the scripture of Genesis 6 and say, God owns this copyright. Amen. I was going to do that. And God says, nah, nah, don't do it, my son. Don't do it. What are you going to accomplish? Uh, you know, some fight is just not worth fighting. But in truth, God owns the copyright for the rainbow color. But the world has hijacked the rainbow color in such a way that you, Christian, that we as Christians would want to disassociate ourselves from the rainbow color because once people see it, the first thing that comes to their mind is not Genesis 6. But the LGBT, if you wear it, that's like a, 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 you saying indirectly, I am a part of the LGBT community, or I am in, I am supportive or supporting the LGBT community. So we shy away from it. The same thing goes for sex and many other things in the Bible that we shy away from when God blessed it, sanctified it, said, be fruitful and multiply. And Hugh Hefner comes along the Playboy. We need to understand that when God in his creation created things, he said, and it was good. Let us never forget that. It was good. I want you to jump over briefly with me to chapter 2. In chapter 1, it gives a, a quick synopsis of God made them both male and female. Let us make man in our own image. But it, give, it didn't give the details of, of, of the creation. And, and in fact, God didn't really give much detail of the other creation. It says, let there be, let there be, let there be. But when it comes to mankind, there is a little bit more thought and effort, so to speak. Let us make man. And there's a little bit more to it. So in chapter 2, verse 4, it says, This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was on the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had caused it to rain, had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. 
the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there, well, let's go down to chapter, we'll go down to verse, verse 15. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Right? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good. See, everything we're reading along, it says, and it was good. It was good. Now, here it comes, I mean, God planned this thing out. He's just doing it in stages. When he says, let us make man, and God created them male and female. So when we read that initial story in Genesis chapter 1, it would seem as if God just created, boom, Adam and Eve, just like that. But no, he didn't. Here is the detail of how that all happened. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Nuns, priests, and the Catholic faith, that's coming from the Lord. You don't have to be celibate to be a minister. Peter, the first pope, was married. And if the Catholic Church will remove that hindrance from their priests and the nuns, they wouldn't be having the major issue that they're having in the Catholic Church. It is the truth. I know maybe a lot of people don't want to say it and go there, but it is the truth. It is not good. I'm not saying everybody's going to get married. The Apostle Paul was not married. And he said it was a gift from God to remain celibate. So he wouldn't struggle like the other guy down the street would because he had a gift from God to remain celibate and to focus on the work of the Lord. It is not good that man should be alone. I would make him a helper comparable to him. I believe the King, King James Urgent says, I'll make him a uh, uh, help meet for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave name to all cattle, to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Amen, somebody. She shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man. So there is a history behind the name, behind the title. She's not just a woman for no reason, but because she was taken out of man, she shall be called woman. So we have man and we have woman. We have male and we have female. And in ultimate creation, God says, it was good. Stay with me here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now the word comparable, where God says, I will make him a helper comparable, or the King James says, meet. It's neged in the Hebrew. 
That means a front, a part opposite, or part opposite, a counterpart, a counterpart, very similar but yet opposite. Very similar but yet opposite. I would make him a helper comparable to him because when Adam brought, when God brought all the animals to, to Adam for him to name them, he could see the lion and the cheetahs and, and the, the fox and everything. And Adam's like, doesn't see anything that resembles him. Doesn't see anything that's comparable to him. And God in his wisdom says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, I'm not going to go into, no, I'm going to go there. Holy Spirit says go there, so I need to go there. Turn with me briefly. Keep your finger right in Genesis chapter 3 because we're coming back there right away. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Sometimes I don't mind paraphrasing things, but there are times when I need to go there and we need to read it together. We need to see it together. Isaiah chapter 14. This is speaking of Lucifer. Lucifer, who is now, we call him the devil, Satan, when he was in heaven and his heart condition. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. See, we, we have a lot of stuff going on in our world, and, and many people just see what's going on just from the, from the natural realm. But if we understand the scriptures, we will know that much of what is going on in our world is very spiritual. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and darkness. Sometimes nations are going to war, they have no idea why they're going to war. But they're just going to war. You who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will. He said it in his heart. But eventually it was communicated in some way, shape, or form because the Bible says about a third of the angels conspired with Satan. They were booted out. So he communicated. He was planning a coup. You have said in your heart, listen to what he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Listen to this. You might want to underline this part because we're going to see in Genesis will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners. So you see what Satan's ultimate goal is? He says, I will be like the most high God. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, real quick. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God Indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God said you will surely die. Satan says you will not surely die. But, but it's not just the fact that he's saying you will not surely die. There, there is more to it. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will 
be like God. I believe the King James Version says you will be as gods. Knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves cover. So the very thing that God Lucifer booted out of heaven because he wanted to be like God is the very same thing that God, mankind, booted out of the garden because Satan tricked Eve in wanting to be like God. But it's all coming back to when God created everything, he said, and it was good. You are good the way you are. Perfectly created. Fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Why do you want to be like God? It is saying that I'm not everything I am meant to be. I'm supposed to be more I'm supposed to be greater. I'm supposed to be something else. But yet when God created you, he said, and it was good. Satan says, for God knows that in the day you eat of this tree, this fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be as God's. Now the Hebrew word there is Elohim, the same word that describes God. In the beginning, God. Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim created. It is used in the singular, it is also used in the plural. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter six, hear O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. You should love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy body, with all thy strength. But we also know it is used in the plural because in the New Testament we see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. When God said in Genesis 2, let us, who was God talking to? He wasn't talking to the angels. He was talking to the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word was the word was with God. There was nothing made that was made without him. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. So it's the same word. You will, in the New King James, you will be like God, uppercase. In the King James, be as God. Now, I believe that is only a matter of semantics or English because it was in reference to Adam and Eve. So both of you will be as gods because it's more than one of you. So you will be as gods. But really, in essence, what Satan was saying, you will be like God. Now, it's very interesting because even this word be should not be taken lightly. This very word be, you would look at this word and you would think it is just another word that is used in the construction of a sentence. You would be like God, but no, no, no. That word be, there is some weight to it. In other words, that word be is similar to where God says in Exodus, I am that I am. It, the connotation behind that word is ever existed. Without beginning, without ending, be, as in Revelation, I am him that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. As they worship as the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is, who is and who is to come. You will be like God. You 
will be omnipotent. You will be omnipresent. You will be like Elohim. Wow. Interesting. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The word evil in the Hebrew is ra. This common adjective arises from raha, another Hebrew word, and it means bad, inferior quality, unpleasant, giving pain, or causing unhappiness. Moral deficiency. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. You're going to know moral deficiency. Adversity. Deadness. Wow. Deadness. The essential meaning of Ra is the inability to come up good standards. You see, God knows good and evil, but he has power to withstand evil. Adam and Eve, if you get to the place where you know good and evil, you will not have the power to withstand evil. Evil will overpower you. That is really what it's all about. Evil will overpower you. So you will be like God. That's what Satan tempted them. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, man, that's, that's good food. Oh, it looks so nice. That's going to, oh man, I'm hungry. She saw that it was good for food. Not that there wasn't many other food in the garden. She saw it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It looked beautiful and delicious on the tree. But that wasn't the main thing. The main thing was really, and a tree desirable to make one wise. Was it that she was hungry? No, there was lots of other fruit trees that she could eat from. So what really got her was the fact that it was desirable to make one wise. So the ultimate reason, the foundational reason why Adam and Eve disobeyed was because they wanted to be like God, not because they were hungry, not because that mango or apple or whatever you want to call it, whatever fruit it was, looked so delicious. They wanted to be like, desirable to make one wise. And the word wise here is shakal in the Hebrew. It means to have wisdom, expertise, intellect, comprehension. So let me ask a question. If I were able to ask Adam and Eve a question, what did God lack in his creation of you? What was God missing when he created you? Every time God did an act of creation, he said, and it, it was good. So I want to ask you, Adam and Eve, since as you were comfortable with who you are, since there were some issues, some inner struggles going on, because you wanted to be someone other than yourself, what was God lacking when he created you? What more do you want? What more do you want? What else would you have liked God to, done to do for you? What? Because obviously, God made a mistake. Obviously, God didn't create, God didn't put in you all that he needed to put in you. We can take this over in so many different levels. We could even take it to the whole transgender stuff that's running rampant in our society today. When a man decides that he's missing something or lacking something and he wants to be a woman or when a woman feels incomplete in himself that somehow a mistake happened god made me into a woman and the truth is there is something in me that is telling me that you are meant to be a man 
And so they make the plans and the adjustments to go and have the change, and they call it the transgender. But when God created you, he said it was good. You are buying into a lie that you are not who you are supposed to be. Fearfully, wonderfully made by the creator God of heaven. And there's nothing lacking in your creation. Not just from your figure, but your intellect, your cognitive ability, and everything about you. God, the creator, made you perfectly. He did not make a mistake. It says, and it was good. God would have created a half man and a half woman in Genesis if he thought it was good. But he created them both male and female. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. God said, it was good. So what we have happening today is the same devil who tempted Adam and Eve to be something or somebody that they are not, that they were not meant to be. You are a man. You are a woman. You are called mankind or human beings. God, he is the sovereign God of all creation. Don't try to be like him out of context. You hear what I'm saying? Out of context, because in the New Testament, Jesus says, if any man desire to come after me, in other words, to be like me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So yes, I want to be like Jesus, and there is a right way to go about that. But Adam and Eve, they bought into the lie. They're missing something. That same lie. The Bible calls Satan the father of all lies. And you see people doing a lot of stuff. Remember, Satan is very active in our world. He is the one that weakened the nations. And he's still spreading lies. People are feeling, going through surgery and doing all kind of stuff because, you know, Lady Gaga, I believe, sang the song, Born This Way. God did not make a mistake. When God created you, he says, and it was good. God created you, he said, and it was good. Psalm 131, David says, how God knit him together in his mother's womb. God wanted a man child, God brought forth a man child. God wanted a female child, God brought forth a female child. God did, I was skillfully wrought in the secret place. God knit together in my mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, your handiworks, oh God, and that my soul knows very well. God says, and it was good. And it was good. This world that God created, it was good. And it was good. We wrecked it. Sin wrecked it. When Adam and Eve sinned, God says, you will die. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread until you return to the dust from which you came. From that day on, mankind was set on a cycle of decay. We grow up, then we grow old, then we decay, we die. But guess what? God subjected this earth to the very same thing. God is going to redeem us. He's going to restore our earthly bodies, as 1 Corinthians 12 says. This corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. So God, God is going to make right all of that, and we shall live with him forever. But so is God going to make right this earth. 
God says this earth will grow old like a garment. Read it in the scripture. Google it. The world, the earth will grow old like a garment and God will grow it up. That's why I'm not part of the environmentalist movement. Because no matter what we do, we cannot redeem this planet. Sin has infected this planet. And God put this earth on the same cycle of decay as the human being. God says, no, 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 I'm going to make this whole thing right. I'm going to redeem you, and I'm going to redeem the earth. That's why in Revelation it says, behold, I make a new heaven and a new earth. So we're, we're, I'm not saying we shouldn't care for the environment and all those things. We should. But we need to be very balanced and careful. There, there, there's a bigger spiritual um, problem than what we see. It's not all natural. It's not all the stuff that's going up in the sky from the big factories and everyone wants to go electric cars and blah, blah. You cannot deal with a spiritual problem through material things. It was good. I want to share with you one more thing and then I want to bring this home. If you turn with me in your Bibles to book of Luke, Luke chapter 4, I believe, Gospel of St. Luke chapter 4, thank you Holy Spirit, hallelujah. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, from the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when he and afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the son of God command this stone to become bread hold on a second you see there's an identity crisis in our world today I'm going to say that again there is an identity crisis in our world today I mentioned a few weeks ago Demi Lovato says, don't call me a she or her. She's neither. Refer to her as they. She said, I'm neither a man nor my woman. What are you? Genesis said God made man and he made woman. At least claim one. Seriously, at least claim one. But I'm not here and I'm up there. Where are you? Identity crisis. Satan said to Jesus, if, if you are the son of God, are you struggling with who you are? Because that wasn't an issue for Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. And I don't have to do anything to prove anything to anybody. If, how dare you, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, 
all will be yours. Wow. Now, I've mentioned this before, but it's very important that we understand the three, these three essential temptations. Because it's the same three temptations that Adam and Eve had to deal with. The lust of the flesh, the Bible talks about the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In Genesis, she saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. These three temptations that Jesus is facing, every temptation that you will come across will fall under the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. That's why the Bible says he was tempted in all points just as we were. Not because maybe Jesus didn't experience a sexual temptation. It still didn't mean he didn't have a temptation that had to be with his flesh. He met all three criteria. He was tempted in all points as we are. Hebrews chapter 4, yet without sin. So Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and says, worship me and I all will be yours. So the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? I can declare to you that many celebrities have made pacts with Satan for their career to progress. This ain't no joke. Satan did it to Jesus. He showed him all the glory, all the kingdoms, all the bling blings, all the fame, all the glory. He says, bow down and worship me, and I'll give it to you. I guarantee you that Satan is still making deals today. The Bible says, do not envy sinners. Do not envy sinners, because you don't know what they are doing to get what they have. Some of them are signing deals with the devil. And when they do their stuff, many of them are making their symbols, secret symbols to show their allegiance that I'm still a part of this society. I still honor you. I still worship you. I'm not a runaway. I'm still a part of the clan. And Jesus in verse 8 answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If, <laughs> again, if, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself, yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, many of us stop right there. Well, verse 13 says, Now when, he, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So Satan didn't give up. He just gave up for that moment, but he sought for other opportune times. So here again, Satan is challenging Jesus' identity. If you are the Son of God. Should Jesus have played along and did what Satan was saying just to prove who he was? No. No. You don't waste God's powers and God's miracles like that to show off. Whenever God is exercising his miracle and his power, it is for a purpose. He's going to minister to somebody. He's not going to show off. I remember I heard a few, uh, few months ago of this one guy that was playing around with this um, snake, deadly snake, quoting Mark chapter 16 that says, you shall take up deadly serpents and they shall not harm you. And he's playing around and sure enough, the snake bit him and he died. 
show it off. That's not what God's power is about. Paul, when he was gathering sticks to make a fire, snake bit him. And the folks were looking, whoa, it's like two hours since he got bitten by that snake. He's still alive. And they know that being bitten by such a snake in maybe half an hour, you're gone. But Paul didn't die. Why? He wasn't showing off. It wasn't legit that happened. I read this scripture in Luke chapter 4 to show the difference between Jesus and Adam and Eve. Now, I don't believe that Adam and Eve would not eventually know good and evil. I believe they would. I believe when the time was right, God would have revealed it to them. But they jumped the gun, so to speak. They took it out of context. It's like a child that conspired to kill their parents because they want the inheritance. The inheritance is yours. It's coming to you. But they can't wait like the prodigal son. Give me my share of the inheritance. I believe when the time will be right, Adam and Eve would go more. God will reveal more to them. There's nothing wrong necessarily in knowing good and evil. God knows good and evil, but he has power to withstand evil. They jump the gun because maybe she felt like I'm not complete. God is hiding something from me because that's how Satan made it seem. God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open. Oh, okay. Hmm. So God knows some stuff and he's keeping some stuff back from me. He knows that your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like him. That's the only reason why he's saying, don't eat, don't eat. Adam and Eve forgot about the part that says you're going to die. They were just so caught up in being like God. You see that? They were so caught up in being like God, they forgot about the part where God says, if you do, you will die. And so Jesus, he's being tempted with some things here. Showed them all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan, in Psalm 2, verse 7, Satan wanted Jesus to question his identity. But I implore you, I encourage you today, know who you are in God. Know who you are. You don't need to be like anybody else. Be yourself. God did not make a mistake when he created you. Be who you are. Don't embrace this identity crisis stuff. It is of the devil, and those who are struggling with it has bought into the lie of the enemy that you can be somebody else. You should be somebody else. You would be better off if you're a woman. You would be better off if you're a man. And I believe some of these people are trapped in their bodies. Because then they made the transition and maybe it doesn't turn out to be what they thought it was going to be. And they're trapped. And now the government says no conversion therapy. You'll be in trouble with the law. If someone makes that transition and realize they made a big mistake and they want to go back to who they are, can you help them? Can you cause? You know what? The government is incriminating themselves because they are the culprits. Because the government has made everything available. If I want to be, become a woman, everything is available to me through the government. There is funding. There is this. There is that. There is counseling. There is therapy. Everything is available to me to transition. They are the one that's promoting conversion therapy. Oh, dear they. How dare they? And some of these people are trapped in who they are because of identity crisis. They want to be somebody that they're not. Know who you are. And so in Psalms 2, I end with this scripture. Verse 7. 
I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. <laughs> Today I have begotten you. Jesus knew who he was. Didn't need to prove anything to anybody. The Pharisee would say, prove this, prove this. Even when he was on the cross, do this, do that. And we will believe in you. If that was many of us, oh man, we would have just given them some of our power. God will show you. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. He's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. What did Satan say to Jesus? The Bible said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. It says, all this authority I will give you if you bow down and worship me. Satan wanted Jesus to jump the gun. God had already promised him that. Context. 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 The day you do it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. God wasn't holding back anything from Adam and Eve. And if he study and you learn how to drive, sure, you can take my ride for a spin. Does that make sense? I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. I will give you the nations as your inheritance. In Revelation, it says, the kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Satan wanted Jesus to bow down and worship him so he could get what God had already promised him. And in the process, questioning his own identity. But I want to remind you today, when God in his act of creation did everything and he rested, he said, it was good. And the very last act of creation, he says, and indeed, it was very good. We sang this morning, we just didn't sing songs just for singing. Lord, you are good. He's a good God, and from his goodness flows good deeds. You have been faithful. We sing of the goodness of God. He is good. And what he made, he declared, he signed it. It was good. Don't question it. Embrace it. God didn't make a mistake. He loves you. Who you are. He loves you the way you are. You might feel imperfect within yourself. You might feel lacking in, in all these different things, but God loves you. He created you. He did not make a mistake. The devil is a liar. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I will declare this message to the LGBT community, to the transgender community, that God loves you, and he did not make a mistake. It was good. God wanted you to be a woman. Oh, he had the power to make you into a woman when you were born. 
And he had the power to make you into a man if that was his design for you. On YouTube and Facebook, you can take on this message all you want. But he's a good God. And he did not make a mistake. And it was good. God, we bless you today. The sacrificial system of Aaron through the Levitical priest line, it was only temporary. It was only a shadow of the ultimate sacrifice and offering that would come. And when John saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of this world. Yeah, there were some problems with that, and God knew it. It was only temporary. But when the true Lamb of God was on the cross, he said, It is finished. The ultimate sacrifice who did not need to die Anxiety, 
Every needy heart today, God, that has a need, you know, Father. I pray, God, you minister to your people. Almighty God, make a way where there seems to be no way. For nothing is impossible with me. He said, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. God, deliver those who are in need of deliverance today. Heal those who are in need of healing today. Touch those who are in need of touch today. Speak a word of encouragement to those who are in need of encouragement today. Provide God for those who are in need of provision. Because our eyes are stayed on you. We look to you, God, from whence cometh our help. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We bless you today, God. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. We go forth on the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ, and your angel will keep charge over us in all our ways. We thank you and give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name and God's people say. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Hope to see you next week. Shalom. Amen.